Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a Christmas list. And um, I have to tell you, I really struggled on creating this because I did a Christmas list for 2022. This is the second Christmas list that, I'm, that I've done. So I did not want to include uh, fragrances from the first list, obviously. So things like Jubilation 25 for Man is out. Feeling Aguil is out. Camel by Zoologist out. Um, Noir Peace by Frederick Mall out. Normal, uh, amazing Christmas fragrances. At a B by Serge Luton. I already talked about those. You can go check out that list from 2022 if you want to get the full breakdown back then of what I said. But basically, in a nutshell, what I said is that now Christmas time evokes different feelings for people than just the fall. You know, fall, you start to think about things like, um, you know, the leaves turning colors and Thanksgiving, and it starts to cool off. But for many people, Christmas is when it really gets cold. Not for me in Texas, because Texas has schizophrenic weather. Tomorrow, it's actually going to be 70, and then it's going to go back down into the 50s, and it's all over the place. But, um, and I am rocking my winter beard. I hope you guys are liking it. Um, this is usually about the time I'm ready to just shave it off, because it starts to get itchy. But I'm going to try to stick through it. Um, and so I thought I would do a top 10 Christmas fragrances. And then I thought, that's not enough. You know, we've had some amazing milestones this year. I'm so happy with the growth of the channel. And um, we just crossed 6,000 subscribers and doing amazing things like interviews with Sultan Pasha. So I figured I would do 10 fragrances that are still in production, according to Parfumo, and 10 that are discontinued. Now, uh, I am being very cognizant of being able to wear a fragrance properly around Christmas time because... The reason I say that is there's many fragrances that may be like museum pieces or they're way out there um, and they may have that opulence and that richness that you would associate with winter, the spices and, and you know, uh, for some reason, uh, spicy fragrances and oriental fragrances and thick resinous fragrances just remind me of being around family and when it's cold outside and the fireplace being on and stuff like that, right? But there are some fragrances that are just borderline unwearable around family members who are not frag heads. You also don't want to choke everyone out. You still want grandpa to be able to eat the Christmas ham, right? Without getting uh, nothing but a nose full of your Beaufort London fragrance, right? And so for me, what I tried to do is I tried to pick fragrances, especially on the discontinued side of things. And it's hard because many of my discontinued fragrances, you know I love the Bellamy's, the Antaeus's, the stuff like that. I, um, I can't include those in that list. Although I would wear them for Christmas, I don't think it would be appropriate to recommend them to you. Uh, and so unless you're kind of a one-off like me and you wear anything anytime, this is supposed to be sort of a more wearable list, okay? So some of these discontinued fragrances uh, may still be pretty easy to find because they're not the, you know, Derby from 1985 uh, Eagle bottle that's selling for $1,000 anymore. I'm not including stuff like that. These are still pretty regularly available for the most part on the discontinued side. And the stuff that's all still available, I think, is also pretty easy to get. So uh, this should be a fun list. This list for me is about opulent fragrances that really bring people together, right? That's what I'm thinking. So the first one on the list is actually a fragrance that, uh, well, I guess we should do Scent of the Day before I start rattling off the uh, Christmas fragrances. So first of all, Scent of the Day is a florist fragrance and it's the only florist fragrance in my collection and this could actually be in this video in my opinion this is leather oud and this is so good uh that i would actually i want to try more from the brand just because of how much i like this now i will say that after about four or five hours it starts to turn into something that i don't like as much okay so the dry down once you get into hour six seven uh it starts to turn a little uh um, I don't want to say the word amber wood, but I do want to say it loses that gentlemanly touch because there's something very, uh, I would say, captivating about the way they made this fragrance because the way they use that geranium note gives off a little bit of an old school gentlemanly vibe. You know, there is some of that in there, but there's also this leather and oud. Apparently, the uh, copy from this, from the brand, is that when they originally used to get their oils to create their fragrances, they used to come in little leather pouches. And the leather in here is supposed to recreate that leather pouches that florists used to get when they got their essential oils, God knows how long. Florist claims to have been founded in like the 1720s or something. I have no clue. They, they claim to be older than the House of Creed. So who knows which one's telling the truth. Uh, I would probably venture to believe Floris over Creed's story, 
but um, I really don't know if their their backstory is true or or what. But um, but I do really like this fragrance. And for someone who's been digging into the artisanal ouds lately, like the Ensars and the Ariz Ladores and stuff like that, that is saying a lot. Uh, but this is not an animalic, funky Indian oud. It's a it's a well done Western style designer oud. Uh, I think it's overpriced, but if you can get it at a discount like I did, definitely worth checking out. So florist leather oud, and I think this would work on Christmas with family because, like I said, it has that sort of gentleman side with the bergamot. The leather is not too overbearing or smoky or black. It's a little bit ambery in the base, and the oud note is actually well done for a Western style oud. So bravo, florist. Um, okay, so let's get started. So last year I recommended Jubilation. 25 for men, which I'm going to do a full review on that very soon now that Jubilation 40 is out. But today we're going to begin this video with the women's Jubilation 25 because I think that this is one of the most underrated Amouage fragrances. And you talk about opulence and grandeur and you think about, you know, the three wise men and you think about myrrh and frankincense and myrrh and all that stuff uh, and gold and Jubilation 25 for women brings all of that to mind. It's a beautiful, spicy oriental, probably the best work Lucas Suizak has ever done, in my opinion, although most people won't say that. They'll probably say Reflection Man or something like that. But for me, it's this. Um, I think this is better than Shem or anything else that Lucas Suizak created. This is a fantastic Shepra that gets overlooked. I, I know I love Diaghilev, and I've talked how much I love Diaghilev, uh, and there is a little bit of Diaghilev in Jubilation 25 for women. There's a lot of cumin in the top, and I think that's what puts people off, is they smell that cumin for the first 15 minutes, and they're like, nope, not gonna, not, this is not for me. They don't really give it a chance to dry, and um, this fragrance, when it properly dries down. Now, to be fair, I do have an older version uh, back when the Sultanate of Oman actually owned Emwaj. Um so I don't know what the modern bottles are like, but I can tell you that if it's anything like this, even if it's lost a little bit of a step, I mean, this has shades of Mitsuko, it has shades of Rochas Femme, it has shades of Diaghilev, it's just a beautiful, and then of course you get that Amouage frankincense, and one thing you'll notice if you've smelled some older Amouages, uh, like Gold, Man, and Woman, the Way and Silver um, Cologne, or, or Silver Crystal, which I did a review on, um, is the way that they sort of blend the flowers, the, this lemony rose and ylang ylang combo is something that has almost like a little bit of a signature for Amouage and you smell it in Jubilation 25 and it is beautiful. I mean, it's fantastic, brilliant creation. And there's myrrh in the base. So um, if you watched my, this is not a top 10 myrrh video, this made the list and um, uh, that video was so long it ended up cutting off the last 15 minutes, so apologies to people who watched that video and didn't get to see the end, but um, we got most of it through. So, But Jubilation 25, first on the list, still available for purchase. Second on the list is another Amouage. We have two Amouages, three Guerlains, two Chanel's, um, two Critizias. It's a good day. Today's a good day. Um, and it's also a good day for the Ram. The Ram is in good spirits with everything that's going on in his life. So this is a... Uh, flanker, and it's a unisex flanker. This fragrance was originally targeted towards men. It was interlude man, and of course with the new trend of everything being unisex, they created a flanker and they called it interlude black iris. You, you realize there's no man or woman on it anymore. Now it's unisex. Although I think maybe they market it towards men. Um, I think it's supposed to be considered unisex from my understanding. Um, that's why there's no more man or woman on there, but who knows? I don't know what they're doing with their gender genderization. I like the fact that Amouage did men and women's fragrances. Everyone seemed to applaud Amouage when they did took away it. I was not one of those people. I like the fact that they were one of the few houses that still did men and women's fragrances, but that they'll never go back. It doesn't matter. Um, but Interlude Black Iris sort of takes that DNA of the original Interlude, and it softens it up. It takes out that strange oregano note and adds a, a traditional rosemary and violet leaf opening which makes it does make it lean masculine um, but there's a beautiful florentine iris in here um if you've ever smelled yours bois d'argent um there is a brilliant florentine iris in in there uh, there's also myrrh in here so this was in my myrrh video as well there's a lovely orris butter that just softens everything up and if you know the original interlude dna you'll still pick it up it's got that smoke 
you know, the resins, the oud touch, heavy patchouli. Um, one day I wore the OG interlude to work and someone and someone walked walked in down the aisle where I sit and they were like, is someone just wearing pure patchouli oil? What am I smelling? Uh, it was the OG interlude because that thing just pumps out like a beast. But um, this one's a little softer and a little more wearable. So that's why it ended up making the cut for Christmas. You won't choke everyone out with this one. I would just be careful with the sprays, but a very opulent, complex, layered fragrance, right? Interlude Black Iris, brilliant, brilliant um, flanker. I've come around. I've come around. I was upset Amouage did flankers at first because I was like, Amouage doesn't do flankers, you know. Now I've, I've accepted it. They did a good flanker. Um, interlude Black Iris. Okay, now on to three Guerlains. And one, according to Parfumo, this is still in production, but... Uh, I think maybe this is one of the ones you'd have the most problem finding. Uh, even though it says it's still in production, I, I don't think they ever moved this to the new line. I think maybe you still have to go to the Guerlain Boutique in, in France to get it. I have no idea. But this is Rose Nacri du Desert. Um, and this is a beautiful rose, patchouli, saffron, oud fragrance. Um, I mean... I know a lot of rose ouds kind of get, um, they get pushed to the side because people are tired of them. This came out in 2010, and I do think that this is actually one of the best in the line. Uh, there is a lot of patchouli. You get spices in here. There's a little bit of turmeric, which is a note you don't usually see in um, perfumery from the designer houses. You see turmeric and stuff like Bortnikoff's and Aris Ladores and Ensar ouds and stuff like that. And it's a base of benzoin and myrrh. So if you look at the uh, shimmery Guerlain sort of, I love these old bottles. I wish they never did away with them, but you can see the Guerlain B here, the different versions of the B uh, in the circle going up, um, pointed down, just uh, beautiful. And then the shimmery look of gold, very oriental in style. Um, and that's what the fragrance feels like. It's a opulent floral. There's a lot of rose. The rose in here is said to be Persian rose which I can't really speak to of how Persian rose smells versus other rose fragrances versus, versus other roses. Although I did do an interview with Russian Adam, the Russian Adam interview part two, where we went through each and every material he sent me and we went through all the different types of roses and his take uh, on it is on that live stream. So I would urge you to go check that out. But I think this would be amazing for Christmas. It just has that opulent Middle Eastern grandeur, but it's done in a Guerlain way. You know, it has a classic... Um, you know, high upstanding house. Uh, Guerlain used to have, some people used to, you know, give Guerlain a hard time for having that elitist feel, like we're Guerlain, you know, we, um, we, uh, we on only a Guerlain makes a Guerlain, right? And, but there is a little bit of that in here, but in a good way, if that makes sense. So, you know what? I feel like I should be spraying some of these since this is a celebration and I want to spray some of these. So let's spray. I don't want to spray them all because this room will smell crazy, but let's spray this one. It's been a, it's been a little bit since I uh, had a chance to smell it. Rose Nakari. I know what interlude and jubilation 25 for women's are like. This one, it's been a bit since I've had a chance to wear it. Let's, let's spray. Let's make this a celebration, a true Christmas celebration. Oh yeah. It's just, you know, I get a little bit of, um, obviously the saffron right front and center. You get a lot of that saffron. It's very, um, apparent. A saffron and patchouli are the two big notes actually in this one first, right out of the gate, especially off the strip. And of course that Middle Eastern style, almost dusty desert-like rose, you know, the Persian rose. I don't know if it has a little bit of fruitiness to it or what, but it's, uh, it's beautiful. Mean, this is a beautiful fragrance. The oud is very tempered. You know, if you're worried about that oud note, I wouldn't worry about it at all. It's very tempered, very well done oud. The oud actually in leather oud that I'm wearing today comes out much more than the oud in rose nakri du desert. I guess that turmeric is probably where that spiciness is coming from. I got a lot of it right. Maybe even a touch of bergamot when you first spray. Maybe just a hint of bergamot and then it disappears. The cardamom and turmeric are kind of playing off of each other with the woods. And it's got that resinous Middle Eastern base that Thierry Vassar created for this line. Different from the regular Guerlainade. It's not the normal Guerlainade. This is a special base he created for this Middle Eastern line. Benzoin and myrrh. It's beautiful. I mean, for, for a Guerlain, they 
for a French house doing this type of perfumery. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Actually, you, you, if you told me, hey, Ramsey, I've smelled every single one in that line, and this is the best one in the line, I don't think I could argue with you. I think Bois Mastidio is probably more to my taste, but this has a little bit of Bois Mastidio in there. You can definitely feel, you know, Bois Mastidio, I think, was the first, which we used to be known as Sange du Bois de Ed. It was the uh, first, and then I think... Cherry Vasso was sort of riffing off of it and doing different things, and this was one of the things he riffed off of it, I think, and he did very well. Um, so if this truly is still in production, this is, I think, worth a sniff. Uh, Rose Nakri du Desert. Okay, let's do a couple of the more easier Guerlains to find. So the first one here is the Eau de Parfum, okay? Eau de Parfum of L'Homme Ideal. So this is the older bottles when... It used to be like this. Guerlain changes bottles like, you know, you change your shirt every day. Guerlain constantly is just changing bottles. Now the cap is no longer gray. It's black. They've made the sticker a little different. It looks like it's metallic gunmetal underneath. Um, and they have made it completely clear here. So there's no longer this gray outline. I actually prefer the older bottle. Go figure. But um, Guerlain is, is, has... Um, homogenized that bottle because they put other stuff in there that should not be in there. Like, for example, they put Vetiver in there, Abbey Rouge is in that bottle, Heritage is in that bottle. Just a, I really don't like what Guerlain is doing with their bottles. But um, let's sniff L'Homme Ideal Eau de Parfum. And, and the reason I emphasize the Eau de Parfum is the Eau de Toilette I have smelled before, although I don't own it. Um, and... I wasn't a fan. Uh, it had something very generic in it, that generic mall type scent. This one, yes, this is much more Guerlain. Even though this is sweet, there is a sweetness to this. And you know what's funny is um, for where I'm at in my journey, you would think I really don't would not like this because I really don't like sweet fragrances. But I love the way Guerlain does this type of perfumery. I really think nobody does... Something like this, which I guess you could call this a sweet gourmand for men. Or vanillas. Those two, which can kind of go hand in hand. There's vanilla in this, of course, as well. Um, but instantly you get this beautiful almond note with spices, okay? So it's almondy, it's spicy, it's pudgy. You know what it's like? It's like, you know how when a baby is really young and their legs and their arms are like this fat with rolls, you know? Like you could just touch the roll of their of their arm and like your finger just goes right into the fat because they're just they're they're thick when they're born right um at least my daughter was when she was born i mean her legs she was drinking all of the um uh shakes we were making for her and formula um they chub up right that's what it reminds me of it just the the thickness of this fragrance just reminds me of like a of, of like a, a, a pudgy, there's like a pudgy, pu like a biscuit almost, like a warm, like a warm biscuit. Um, and yes, it's sweet, but it's not overly sweet. You know, it has a little bit of, it's almost like Thierry Vasser used the past to try to formulate something for the future. Like you can smell, Part of me thinks you can smell this Guerlainade base with the Tonka and the sandalwood and the other resins um, and the vanillas from previous Guerlains. You know, there's a little hint in that, even though there's something very modern about this scent. Um, and it turns leathery as the fragrance continues to dry down as well. But that gourmand pudginess, you know, that biscuity, almondy thickness. I wouldn't be surprised if there was heliotrope in here either. Even though it's not listed, there's a heliotrope pudginess, you know, that um, baby with the fat cheek, right? That you, you know, you just, you, like your finger just goes into the fat cheek, right? There's that, there's that feel to the, the pudginess. There's a thickness to this scent. Um, but it's done in, in classy gourmand, uh, classy Guerlain way, if that makes sense. Oh, it's beautiful. You know, for many people consider this to be like a date night scent or something like that. And I think that if you're new to the fragrance game, if you watch my videos and you're like, man, this guy's an absolute nut. He has way too many fragrances, like one or two fragrances is all you need. If you're at that level where you haven't really started collecting yet, but you don't want to wear YSL myself or you don't want to wear, you know, Eros or something like that, 
get Lomity out, Eau de Parfum. The Eau de Toilette is much more designer-like. It's not as interesting to me. Um, the Eau de Parfum has a little bit of a cherry twist to it as well. There's like this cherried, liqueur, almondy, pudgy heliotrope thing going on. Um, it's it's thick, like you're making a mold. You know, like like I've said it before, but heliotrope gives off this feel like you're making a mold, like the dentist mold, make a mold of your teeth or something. There is this um, this this pudginess to it, and um, there's a little bit of smoke in here as well. Maybe a little bit of maybe a touch of frankincense. Uh, a little bit of Bulgarian rose. Very, very well done for a designer. Okay, and then if you say, hey, I've got that. Maybe I'm looking for a flanker. Um, next on the list of still available fragrances for Christmas, Lome Ideal Extreme. Now, the Extreme is a flanker that came out in 2020. This is already the older style bottle, so they've already changed it. Um, into the commoditized bottle. This also now has a black cap, a silver background. I like this bottle much better, uh, but you can see already, even in the vintage bottle, they did away with what was on the side. So Guerlain is constantly playing with their bottles. Um, so they kept that almondy, you know, leather thing, right? Um, they have toned down the vanilla, although you definitely get it. Um, there's still a little hint of vanilla, but what they've added is a couple notes that almost change the fragrance entirely. One is plum, um, and the plum note here is beautiful. No matter how you slice it, no matter how you like your plum, I know the other day I uh, talked about a plum fragrance. Um, the, it was print by the House of Prin Parfums. It was called Mogao, and uh, Mogao was a sort of series of caves in China that this fragrance was named after. And there's a plum note in there. And I mentioned that that particular plum note was not like the plum note in uh, Rochas Femme, where it was very sort of decadent, dripping with red juices and very sexualized. It wasn't like that at all. It was almost like a ripe plum. The plum here is different again. It's almost like a designer created, created plum. It's almost like if you... It's almost like if you... Um, go to someone's house and they have a, a basket of fruit on their table. And you're like, man, that is the most perfect looking plum ever. You go to pick it up and you're like, well, the reason it's perfect looking is because it's fake, but it looks like the most perfect plum. The plum in here, um, it has a little element of, of that, you know, imagine the glossiness shining off of a fake plum, but you can definitely tell it's plum. But my favorite note in here is this addition of cinnamon and tobacco. And the cinnamon and the tobacco make the fragrance feel much warmer and richer. The, the tobacco note in here is actually really well done. It is, um, it's dry, it's hay-like. Yes, there are those sweet notes floating around, but it doesn't smell like a ultra-sweetened tobacco itself. It smells like a sweet fragrance, but the tobacco note on its own smells almost, you can isolate it almost. Um, and it has hay-like facets. Sweet, but um, not too sweet. And they finally admit to that heliotrope note in here. There's definitely, I think there's definitely heliotrope in the first one as well. But um, there's some patchouli and cedar. So it does turn woody, leathery, tobacco-y. But um, um, it almost changes the fragrance, what they've done. Just even though it is a flanker, this is what a flanker should be. I think this is a well-done flanker. And... Yes, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Even though I should not like these two fragrances, I do. You can see I haven't worn them very much because I have so much perfume to wear. But I like what Guerlain did with those. Those are two quality, quality designer releases. If you're someone new to the fragrance game and you want good designer perfume, L'Omidial Eau de Parfum and L'Omidial Extreme are two I would recommend. Definitely. Um, okay. Next on the list. So last year I recommended... Serge Luton Filinagio, which is perfect for Christmas because it has this outdoor pine. It's almost like you're standing in a field of Christmas trees and, you know, you can smell the sap on your hands. There's fire. There's um, smoke in the background. The chimneys are, are burning. Uh, you, can, you can smell the smoke in the air and uh, you can just feel this beautiful, fresh winter day, right? You look up at the sky. The sky is blue. And... Um, 
Feeling Aguil is perfect, perfect Christmas fragrance, I think. And if you don't have Feeling Aguil, though, this is my second choice. Uh, this is Arso by the House of Perfumum Roma. Shout out to my good friend Jeff, who sent me this bottle. Very, very kind of you, mate. Um, and Arso is sort of um, Perfumum Roma's take on that DNA. And you know what? It's a damn good take. I used to think, oh, I mean, instantly, it's almost like you get these um, brown pine needles on the floor. It's not as... It doesn't open up exactly like Feeling Aguil, but it plays in the same sandbox. You know, they're, they're, they're definitely competitors to me. And the note listing on Arso is very simple. Cedar leaf, which in the beginning, it almost smells like you start with the cedar leaves on the ground, but then it starts to turn smoky, like you burned them, like you're setting, you're, you're building the cedar leaves in a pile to set them on fire. And pine resin and uh, leather. Those are the notes. Woody, resinous, green, smoky. Um, oh, and, you know, there is something fresh about the fragrance as well. Just like I said with Feeling Aguil, there's something, it just feels like you're standing in this forest. And you know how sometimes when the air is cold, it hits your lungs? And um, it's it, it almost feels like, uh, like the coldness of the air is somehow cleansing it when you're breathing it in, right? There's something about both scents to me that give me that feel. But I really, really, really like Arso. Like, um, Jeff hit a home run sending me this. He also hit a home run when he sent me Towers Oud. I really like Towers Oud. So he sent me a couple from that that I really like, and he sent me a couple that I'm like, eh, you know, um, Tuxedo by YSL. I'm like, eh, I'll review it, but I'm not a fan. But this is a pure home run. I'm a big fan of Arso. And this may be a winter, this may be the Christmas Day scent for me. I haven't picked one yet. Um, so do vote in the comments. Let me know which ones I should wear for winter. But man, what a fragrance Arso is. I mean, definitely full bottle worthy, 100%. And this brand in general, I have really uh, enjoyed getting to know them in 2023. 2023 is the first time I've got a chance to really experience what Perfume Aroma can, can offer and I am a fan. They're, yes, some people say their fragrances are linear, although they change a little bit, but they stay pretty much on the same trajectory, if that makes sense. Um, but they last forever, and they smell the, the, the oils when they hit your skin. They're so oily and um, so concentrated. They last forever. I love, I love how they wear. They wear thick and heavy and opulent and rich and glamorous. I love those type of fragrances. So, Arso from Perfuma Roma from uh, 2010. Okay, a couple more that are still in production, then we're going to go to the discontinued. So, next on the list is back to our good friend, Uncle Serge, Serge Luton. And this is sort of the uh, Serge Luton that I would say put old Uncle Serge on the map. Well, that's not true, because um, he did some fragrances for Shiseido, like Nombre Noir. That's a unicorn that I would love to have one of these days. But um, this is the one I think that if you asked other perfumers, hey, if you could perfume any fragrance, um, which which one would you perfume? Many times I hear them say this, and this is Feminita Dubois. So Feminita Dubois is a 2009 release for this version with, with Serge Luton, but the original by Shiseido, which came in a, a beautiful bottle. I love a bottle. I think Rich Mitch has two or three bottles of that stuff. Um, in the Shiseido bottle came out in 1992, and it's a trio of just all-star perfumers. Christopher Sheldrake, Pierre Bourdon, and of course Serge Luton um, was in on the in on the creation of Feminita Dubois. And the story goes that they actually went to um, some of the, the, the people at Shiseido at the time, who they had to run these ideas by, and they said, hey, we want to make a woody fragrance, Feminita Dubois, the femininity of wood, right? And they said, hey, we want to make a woody fragrance. And they said, okay, so you want to make a masculine fragrance? They said, no, we want to make a woody fragrance for women. And they were like, we don't understand. You want to make a woody fragrance? That means you're making a masculine fragrance. And they said, no, we want to make a woody fragrance for women. It was like they couldn't compute, right? Um, and this really sort of pushed the boundaries at the time. It is woody, it's spicy, but you know what it has? It has this um, Serge Luton fragrances for me, and he's done it again and again, and I can really see 
what he likes because apparently um, Serge Noir is his signature scent and I have reviewed that on the channel. And the way that the cedar note, um, the way that the cedar note, the woody note mixes with clove and other spices and this plum note, which again, you can see um, plum has come up a couple times in here and oh yes. Oh, just this will be per. This is a perfect winter scent, uh, Christmas scent, because it has all the elements. The spices are there. That reminds me of, um, you know, being in around family and the fireplace crackling. The um, warmth of cinnamon just feels like you know you're in your favorite sweater around friends and family. Um, the fruits, not as much as Atabee, of course, the Atabee by Serge Luton is another one of the ultimate Christmas scents because it literally smells like Christmas cake. Uh, I've ever had Christmas cake with the little nuts and, and um, you know, candies in, in the bread. That's that's what Atabee smells like. But the plum in here does have just a little feel of, you know, maybe baking some sort of um, desserts for... for um, there's just a little bit of that dessert feel, but then that cedar, clovey, um, you know, spiciness comes in. And finally, just a little touch of honey, just a touch of honey and peach. And so, and of course, the florals are beautifully executed. The violet, ylang ylang. The vanilla is never too much. The musk is perfect. Everything is just perfectly balanced. But that woodiness, that cedar note, you know, you smell that way that this, the woods contrast with the spices in other Serge Luton fragrances over and over and over. And so I'm a huge fan of this. Glad to have multiple bottles. Uh, maybe I picked up the one that wasn't even sprayed. I can't remember. Um, yeah, I must have. I must have sprayed the unsprayed one. But um, mm, huge. I think this would be perfect. And don't worry about it being marketed for women. This is completely unisex. In fact, nowadays, it may even lean a little bit masculine because of the cedar and the spices. Man, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of um, Feminita Dubois. Okay, next on the list, one of the all-time great Christmas scents, I think, for me, because, again, um, it has so many elements that just perfectly represent, let's say, a beautiful Christmas morning. This is Chanel Egoist. And the other thing with the Chanel and Feminita Dubois, I would say, those, these last two especially, is they have class. They have, um, you're, you will not go wrong picking up Feminita Dubois, and you will not go wrong wearing Ego East on Christmas Day either. Very spicy and woody, and the woods in here are, I guess I should have a pen that works. Uh, um, hang on, let me mark this down, Ego East. So the woods in here are unique and different, and yes, it is sort of a, I guess you could consider it a oriental style fragrance. Uh, many people just talk about the sandalwood in, in Ego East, and it's true. The sandalwood is amazing. This is actually a vintage bottle when they said La Ego East. And I don't know, you know, the batch code on the bottom says 0427. And on the back, it's W1X3DA. I think this is an early 90s bottle, but... Oh, it's perfect. I mean, this is another one that's just perfect in class all the way. That spicy woodiness, um, you definitely get the spices of the coriander right away. Mandarin orange is prominent. And this sort of cinnamony, just um, uh, cinnamony tobacco with that sandalwood base. Later on, more leather will come out from memory. It's just beautiful. Just an absolute, just a, it's going to get a Vintage Hall of Fame review for sure. Ego East deserves a Vintage Hall of Fame re review, just like Antaeus. Antaeus is my favorite Chanel for men, but Ego East is so good. There's a touch of sweetness, but not too much. The vanilla adds just a little bit of sweetness, and I love the old school carnation note in here. Love it. Love the carnation and rose combo. And even though this was marketed towards men, I think this would smell amazing on a woman. Absolutely amazing on a on a um, on a woman that is willing to take the chance and wear a fragrance like this marketed towards men. Um, 
I think the rosewood and maybe the mahogany wood in the top add, keep it a little bit masculine, but um, I think this would smell just great on a woman. So Ego East from 1990, brilliant for Christmas, I would say, a beautiful Christmas day scent. There's almost a hint of dried fruits, although there isn't any dried fruits listed. It's almost like you can get a hint of dried fruits. It's beautiful. Um, okay, next on the list, we have another Chanel. And this one, I've heard Eugene say a couple times that this actually shares some similarities with Ego East, and I actually agree with him. Um, this is from 1984, so probably this is what sparked the idea of, um, of Ego East. And this is Chanel's Coco. Now, uh, again, this is marketed towards women, but this is such an opulent, rich, oriental. And Jacques Polge created this. Uh, I guess even though Francois de Machy isn't on this Parfumo perfumer list, they don't give him credit. He had to have played a hand in this, I would assume. Let's see if I can get this blotter in here. Oh, yes, baby. Just perfect. Um... Oh, wow. I love these 80s feminine targeted fragrances. We're going to talk about a bunch of them here because I think they would fit perfectly for this occasion. But um, Coco is one of my favorite sort of oriental style fragrances for, for women from the 80s. Oh, my God. I mean, um... So there's some frangipani water that's used in Ariz La Dore's um, Ottoman Empire. And you get just a little bit of that frangipani in, in the top of, um, of cocoa, okay? And just like with um, Ego East, what's interesting is they both have mandarin orange in the top. But what's, what's different, I think, is here it goes much quicker into the classic 80s feminine heart, right? So you get the ylang ylang, orange blossom, iris, jasmine, and rose coming, rushing to the to the top, right? So at first you're going to get that coriander and mandarin, which is a very similar combo. If you look at Ego East, that also has coriander and mandarin in the top. So there is a little bit of a similar opening, but with Coco, I get that frangipani that just spark sort of a like a like a electric shock reminder of Ottoman Empire by Arise Ladore just for a moment and then it goes into those florals fast and heavy and along with those florals you get a little bit of angelica it's slightly green um but the iris in here with the honey is just unbelievable and then I think what really makes this different is the florals are so amped up compared to Ego East and the woods are so amped down. Um, it's mostly benzoin and honeys and ambers and patchouli and there's a little bit of civet, but of course this is Chanel. So everything is done with a very deft hand. Nothing is out of, nothing is too animalic or out of place ever. But I've worn this to work. Um, you know, I, I have no problem wearing cocoa as a as a guy. Slightly powdery, but mostly floral, and that that ambery honey in the base, just brilliant. I think it's perfect for Christmas. Whether you're a, whether you're um, whether you're a guy or a girl, I I would have no problem wearing either Ego East or cocoa. I think they would work great on on a man or a woman. Even though Coco is marketed towards women and Ego East is marketed towards men, I would try try it. If you've ne if you're a guy and you've never tried Coco and you like Ego East, I would urge you to try Coco. And if you're a woman and you've never tried Ego East and you like Coco, I would urge you to try Ego East. Um, there definitely is a similarity. I think Ego East is much more traditionally. Um, sorry, Coco is much more traditionally in that '80s feminine. Uh, but I could see how Ego East spun off of that. Brilliant creations by Jacques Polge. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Even just smelling them on the blotter. On skin, they're even better. That's the thing. On skin, they're even better. Okay, the final fragrance that's still in production, and then we'll go to the discontinued line. So, um, of course, if you're going to talk opulent oriental fragrances, for me, there's only one. 
Um, probably my favorite opulent oriental of all time. And this is YSL's Opium from 1977. You see the bottle probably missing behind my head. You knew it was coming. Um, and, and so Opium is uh, one of my all-time favorite fragrances. Top 10 fragrance of all time for me. It was created by Jean-Louis Suizac and Jean Amique. And, um, my God, I mean, I don't even need to, um, I don't even need to dip the blotter in here, but I'm going to, because I love this fragrance so much. Um, yes. So, um, rumor is Raymond Shailan, I think it was Raymond Shailan, but I can't remember who they said. It, it, it might've been Gerard. It, I think it was Raymond Shailan. Rumor is that he created that mandarin orange um, top of, of opium. So there's some mandarin orange, plum, and fruits that kind of hit you in the beginning, along with some spices. The spices are pepper, clove, coriander, and bay leaf, or, or laurel. And the jasmine in here is just so opulent and um, realistic. But the fragrance very quickly devolves into this um, intoxicating drug-like, that's where the name opium came from. I mean, there literally is this drug-like apopinax and myrrh and resins. And if you've heard me describe, um, interlude, the blue beast, like being in an opium tent, this is the original, like being in an opium tent. And it's full of apopinax and myrrh and tolu balsam and labdanum and sticky gummy resins. And, reference oriental like if you were like ramsey what is an oriental fragrance this is the one that i would just be like here spend a year with this spend a year with um with with opium and i would also urge you to try this right here this is actually discontinued so we're about to get into the discontinued names this is not one of the discontinued ones so you get a bonus here uh, but opium secret de parfum before they went to the eau de parfum is a different formula and um I think that this is one of the greatest fragrances in my collection, period. I mean, uh, the myrrh in here is out of this world. Out of this world. Um, I mean, what a fragrance they created. Uh, and opium is, it's an experience. I mean, this is something that, and I'm putting it on the Christmas list. And, and, you know, for me, for some reason, these feminine fragrances from the late 70s and 80s, I, I have no problem wearing them. I never, if I wore this to work or Christmas get-together with family, I wouldn't think anybody would be put off or offended. They were so beautiful. Things like cocoa, opium, some of the ones that are coming here in a little bit. Um, for some reason, when I think about get-togethers, get these old-school orientals or shipras, uh, that were marketed towards women. I almost feel more comfortable in, in them than some of the... Like, I would rather wear some of these feminine targeted fragrances than, let's say, um, the Eau de Toilette of Loma Dial, or Sauvage Eau de Toilette or Blue de Chanel Eau de Toilette or something like that. No, hands down, I would feel more, way more comfortable in these old school feminine targeted fragrances. And just the way they were created and the ingredients, especially in the vintage. This is a um, Charles of the Ritz bottle that I got from Japan. This was a gift, actually, um, from my good friend Cullen. And, um, I, I mean, the ingredients in here will literally knock your socks off. It'll absolutely knock, knock, you, knock you for a six. It's unbelievable. And when, oh, the animalic bits are just starting to come through now. A little bit. I think there's castorium in here, but I'm not sure. Oh, God, I love opium. Um, opium will get its own vintage Hall of Fame review, for sure, 100%. Okay, on to the discontinued fragrances, shall we? So, uh, first one on the list. Speaking of decadent, animalic... Um, Sheepras for women that I absolutely love. The first time I smelled this, go watch my um, unboxing and first impressions of this. It's on my channel. It's before I uh, came up here to this room. It's in my previous room, so the background is a little bit different. But um, all day, I remember the day like it was yesterday, a, a year or two years ago, whatever it was, when I discovered this. And I was just in shock, complete shock. Um, like, how? 
how is this just a random perfume from 1986 that I bought for $30 on eBay? How? This is Crezia's Tietro alla Scala. Um, I've since done comparison videos. I've compared the Eau de Toilette to the Eau de Parfum. Get whatever you can get. It doesn't matter. This is discontinued, just like Opium Secret de Parfum. But um, this is... This is... Oh, God. Huh. This is a Shepra slash Oriental blend is basically what it is. And I have no clue who the perfumer is, but I swear to God, if you told me that this was created by, like, Dominique Ropion or someone like that of his statue, I would believe it. There's hand... I wouldn't even bat an eye. This smells like it was made by a master perfumer. That aldehydic, oh God, it just, oh, it's so beautiful. It just grabs you. You know, there's a little bit fruitiness to it. So it's a little different um, because there's this strange contrast between fruits and aldehydes right at the top. And what ends up happening is almost from the beginning, this animalic beeswax note grabs you. And so it just feels like you're smelling an old school um Shepra slash Oriental, but just covered in animalic beeswax, thick, you know, like you can see the honeycomb that was smeared. When they smeared the beeswax, it was so, it was still in the honeycomb. They just smeared the whole thing. It's so, it's so, it's the definition of rich and opulent. And it's like, you know, Teatro alla Scala is a famous opera house in Milan, I believe, or in Italy somewhere, but I think it's Milan. Um, and it's just, it's literally like the fat lady in in your mind up there just singing just you know luciano pavarotti style just singing to the sky most beautiful voice angelic voice right notes carrying on for minutes keep holding the note just beautiful opera but everything is overdosed everything is big big hair big shoulder pads this is 1986 remember there's oak moss, there's vetiver, there's civet in here, and the civet is slightly animalic, and it just adds that growl. It's perfect. It's perfect because, as a perfume lover, it's opulent, but I would have no problem wearing this because I would know that I'm wearing something that's better than 99.99999% of what else all the other people are out there. Your uncle comes over and he's wearing a $400 Tom Ford? So what? You're beating him with this, I promise you. Um, ah, oh, it's just, you know, when the earthy facets of the oak moss come through, the animalic facets of the civet, slightly pissy, I adore Teatro alla Scala. Uh, I think it's one of the best discoveries. It was, it was a 2022 discovery, so it was the best discoveries of 2022. But, my God, man, Teatro alla Scala. Um, every single women's fragrance I'm going to talk about is good, but Opium and Teatro alla Scala are two that are just unbelievable. Coco is also, of course, unbelievable, but it's very refined. You know, that's much more Chanel-like, right? Um, now, staying with Crezia, but going back in time, we're going back to 1980. I believe this might have even been the original Crezia fragrance from 1980. This was created by Maurice Roussel. This is K de Crezia. And look at that, glass bottles. Look at the difference in the juice color, too. This is the Eau de Toilette. This is the Eau de Parfum. Um, this one's very earthy looking. This one's very uh, fruity, almost looking. More orange. This one's almost more pale, palish. Um, and this is a floral spicy Shepra. And a very well done floral spicy Shepra. So let's take from the Eau de Parfum, since I have more juice here. Um, and Maurice Roussel, of course, this is uh, one of his earlier works because he ended up being known 20 years later for things like uh, Musk Ravageur and Rochas Man and Bond Number no. 9 New Harlem and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know why I keep grabbing this pen that doesn't work. K. de Crizia. Okay. Let's see if I can... Let's see if this will fit. Aha, uh -huh, it will. Okay. So, um, this is very floral, though extremely floral. You get a lot of old school big hair florals without the, um, it doesn't grab you right out of the gate like Teatro alla Scala. It doesn't go big beeswax, 
big civet right away. This one kind of takes its time. It goes, this is a much slower developer. So it really goes through the phases, right? Lots of um, florals here. Hyacinth in the top, which is a big uh, floral note. Hyacinth is a strong flower that can sometimes really overtake everything. You get a lot of that in the beginning. A lot of hyacinth, a lot of neroli, lily of the, lily of the valley, orange blossom, carnation, narcissus, iris, jasmine, rose, tuberose, orchid. Is there a flower that I didn't name? But it's open up with aldehydes, just like um, Tetra Alascala and peach. And um, it dries down to this mossy, sandalwoody civet. It's much more traditional Shepra structure, right? So this is much more traditional Shepra structure. There is some vanilla, but it's but it's not the oriental mashup like uh, Tetra Alascala is. But it, it goes leathery, mossy, earthy, vetiver. Um, there's supposedly real ambergris in here. So yes, Maurice Roussel. Um, a great fragrance. I think a lot of guys, um, this of all the ones I've shown so far, K. de Crezia may be the most traditionally feminine, but I still love it. And I think it would be amazing, especially on a day like Christmas, where you want to wear something opulent and, and grand, but you don't want to wear big stinking amber woods. Something like that would be perfect. Okay, next on the list is probably one of my favorite Calice Becker creations. And um, I know Calice Becker has done some stuff that a lot of people love. But for me, uh, she doesn't have very many huge hits that I would point to and say, man, I re I mean, she does have some. Uh, I love What About Adam. That's probably my favorite uh, from her, along with this one. These are the two Calice Beckers I absolutely love. And this is called Queer de Lancome. Now, again, these are discontinued from the Crezia, Teatro alla Scala onward. These are all going to be discontinued. But this is um, one you may be able to find because there's not a lot of hype on this. But this is supposed to be sort of a vintage take on a leather fragrance. But it's very, it's a very floral leather. So uh, you get a lot of ylang ylang, a lot of jasmine. There's some hawthorn in here, which adds this white feel to the fragrance. Hawthorn always makes me feel of like white leather. Um, Jean-Claude Elena used it to perfection in Queer d'Ange, uh, and there's a little bit of saffron in the top. Remember, this is 2007, before everyone started making a rose saffron oud. So you might be surprised at the way the saffron smells in here. But the, um, star of the show is this waxy sort of styrax in the base, an iris. And so it's like an irisy styrax with a little bit of birch. Birch adds a touch of the smokiness, and, um... Um, very vintage in feel. This is a very vintage. Remember with um, how I said that um, low medial eau de parfum feels sort of pudgy, like um, punch, pushing in on a fat baby's cheek, right? Uh, this has a little bit of that pudginess, that thickness. There is this, um, there's layers to this fragrance. It feels like it's very dense. It's thick, okay? This is a tomb, but it's vintage in feel. And so if you've ever heard of a fragrance by the house of Caron called Tabac Blonde, which is a leather iris carnation bomb from back in the day that I would love a vintage bottle of Caron's Tabac Blonde, high on my wish list of things that'll probably never happen. Um, but this is supposed to be like their interpretation, Lancome's interpretation of, excuse me, Tabac Blonde, which is no longer in existence, I don't believe. So um, if you're a fan of leathers, that's a very interesting leather. Not my favorite type of leather, because you know me, I love the Bellamy and Antaeus, but I think that would go over really well on, on Christmas. Okay, next on the list is another discontinued fragrance. Well, of course, they're all going to be discontinued from this moment on, but um, this is another one where I'm going to show you both the Eau de Toilette and the Eau de Parfum, and I'm going to tell you it doesn't matter which one you go for, but this is called La Nuit. La Nuit by Paco Rabanne, The Night. Um, the Night by Paco Rabanne is a fragrance that has inspired many, including our good friend Sultan Pasha, who did an interview with me. He is going to make his own version of La Nuit, which I cannot wait to smell. I hope I get to smell that one day. Um, but this is a spicy, animalic Shepra. So this is probably one of the closest fragrances I've smelled to Teatro Alla Scala. These two sort of play in the same sandbox, if you will. Teatro Alla Scala came out in 86. 
This actually came out in 85 and it was perfumed by Jean Guichard. And I'm really a big fan of Jean Guichard. I am not a big fan of his son, who um, I think uh, runs that house mate. Um, oh gosh, the one that does uh, Falcon Leather. Falcon Maitre, Maitre Premier, Aurelian Guichard, I believe is his, is his son. I really like the name Aurelian, but I'm not a fan of his uh, creations, to be honest with you. Um, but Jean Guichard made some absolute fantastic fragrances, and this is one such fra fragrance. So this is the um, Eau de Toilette, and this is the Eau de Parfum. And I will tell you that it doesn't matter. Just like with uh, Teatro Alla Scala, get whatever you can get. These are amazing, old school. Oh, God. I mean, just the brilliance of the ingredients. Um, there's a little bit of more green in the top here. So they've used things like myrtle, uh, uh, artemisia. So there's a little more bitter green, spicy green. There's also some cardamom in the top of this and pepper. So it does go in a little different direction, but once it really starts hitting in the florals and the peach and the oak moss and the civet kick in, uh, and, and the patchouli, of course, and a little bit of leather, it, uh, it, it does start getting closer to Tietro Alla Scala, but it's missing one of my favorite ingredients, and that's that beeswax note. So um, if you made me pick, I would pick Tietro Alla Scala, but this is a really, really good fragrance by Paco Rabanne. La Nuit, The Night from 1985. Okay, so we've gone through some amazing women's fragrances, so let's talk about some masculine fragrances. So let's do a fragrance that just recently got discontinued, and you can still find bottles pretty easily. Um, it's from a house that doesn't get much talk. It's the house of Animal. And this is called Animal Animal for Men. Be careful, because there's an Animal for Men, which is a completely different fragrance than Animal Animal for Men. And what I love about this fragrance is this fragrance um, came out in 1994. So it came out after Thierry Mugler's Angel came out. But what's interesting is it came out before Thierry Mugler's Amen came out. And so it came out a couple years before Amen came out. Someone left me a comment the other day and said, I should be called Ramsey the Fair, because I like to give credit to fragrances who've kind of done a style before another fragrance house has done it, but they don't get as much talk. This is one such fragrance. And, oh man, instantly that honey patchouli of Amen hits you, right? Honey patchouli, pineapple, tobacco, lavender, jasmine, amber, vanilla, sandalwood, lemon, lily of the valley, musk, nutmeg, ylang ylang, cedar, galbanum, lime, and rose. Now, this is definitely a designer, okay? these You could find bottles of this before it got discontinued for $18. I think I got this bottle for $18 or something. Um, but... The value that you get, like if you like that Amen DNA, which I do, and it's discontinued now, which is unbelievable to me that L'Oreal discontinued Amen. They must be completely out of their minds. I don't know what they're smoking at L'Oreal headquarters, but I think they're totally out of their minds. Um, some people say this gives them a pure Havan type vibe because of the tobacco in here. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's much closer to the original Amen. But it is technically a sweet gourmand, but I think this would go over brilliantly at a Christmas get-together because not many people are wearing Amen anymore. And this is a little different scent profile from Amen. But it's so good. I don't think it has that tar-like aspect from Amen. But what a fragrance this is. Totally, totally underrated. Very few people talk about Animal Animal. I absolutely love it. 1994, discontinued, uh, according to Parfumo. It was last marketed by Parlux. So, very sad days. Okay, next on the list, let me make some room because I do want to spray this. Next on the list is a Thierry Mugler fragrance. And I tried to pick stuff that I thought would not be too offensive. And I think this is one of the best, if not the best, Amen Flanker. Okay? This fucking pen. Um, so this one is called Amen. A taste of fragrance. A taste of fragrance, or as it's known in the community, pure chili. 
So pure chili is what this is known in the community because it's supposed to have a hot and spicy chili note in it. But actually, it's not called pure chili. It's called a taste of fragrance. Um, and amen. Let's see if I can find it now. Uh, amen. So interestingly enough, if you go to Amen on Parfumo, it says it's still being marketed by L'Oreal, but rumor is that uh, it's going to get drawn down soon. Uh, a taste of fragrance. Okay, so Gourmand Spicy Discontinued. Uh, uh, apparently the face of this fragrance was Oscar Pistorius, the guy who killed his girlfriend or something. I forget, the Olympic guy that had his ha didn't have legs or, or uh, he, he was the uh, face of this fragrance. Uh, advertising campaign, I believe. And then whenever what happened with him happened, they had to very quickly switch gears. So they started to say, oh, they brought in like actual chefs to create the fragrance. I don't know if they did or they didn't, but um, I will tell you that I love, for someone that does not like sweet fragrances, okay, <laughs> you would think that the Amen line in me would be like oil and water, but I love, I love the Amen line. And honestly, I love wearing them, especially on cold winter days like they just they imprint this memory you know i can remember exactly the last time i wore this the exact day and what we did um it just it brings back that memory and this is a yes it's a gourmand because it's a coffee there's a coffee note in here that's very prominent as is this chili note so chili in the top coffee in the base but you get that amen lavender um lavender coriander peppermint and cedar and and bergamot with cedar, patchouli, red pepper, tonka bean, musk, and syrac. So that chili note mixing with the red pepper, mixing with the coffee, definitely gives it a little bit of a red, red tint, right? And if you look at the juice color, they went with the red. Uh, and I think they did a really good job with the marketing on this one. So, um, but it, it definitely has that amen dna many of the amens share a lot of similarities with a little twist here or there but when this dries from memory what ends up happening is is the those spicy notes that right now seem so red just kind of calm down and it dries down to a spicy amen and it just works it just works beautiful um that a little bit of that ethyl maltol sweetness, the patchouli, which you cannot get away from in, in the Amen releases, the lavender in the top, and um, the musky styrax in the base. Beautiful. Succulent, hot, and spicy. Woody oriental spicy is what they say. La goutte de parfum. The taste of fragrance. The taste of fragrance, excuse me. The taste of fragrance. Brilliant uh, flanker from Amen. Discontinued, but I think that would go amazing on, on Christmas. Okay, uh, three, one, two, three, four more to go. So next on the list, we have a fragrance that only came out in 2016, 2016, already discontinued, uh, but you can still find bottles sometimes on the cheap. And this is Sarah Jessica Parker's Stash. So Sarah Jessica Parker's Stash is a well done designer woody fragrance is basically what it is to me um i'm not going to sit up here and say this is a masterpiece or anything like that i just think it's a well done sort of um take on a on a smoky woody designer right so many modern uh molecules use this woody dna you probably smelled it a lot right but i don't think many fragrance houses use it properly. When it's not used properly, it doesn't smell very good. Here, Sarah Jessica Parker, from what I hear, is a big frag head. And um, Laurent Laguernec and Clement Gavari, who's Max Gavari's son, teamed up to create this fragrance. So it opens up with black pepper and sage and, and grapefruit zest. And I'll tell you kind of a perfumer whose work this reminds me of. This reminds me a little bit of Nathalie Lorson. So if you know her work, on the Encre Noir series, or what she did with the House of Montana. Um, there's a touch of that style of perfumery in Stash, right? Just a, just a well-made cheapy, um, something that doesn't feel like it should be $30. And Stash 
um, has it has a little bit of a twist too because there's a pistachio note in here so along with the peppery atlas cedar there's little hints of um, pencil shavings if you will and um, masoria wood and along with the masoria wood is frankincense musk vetiver and pistachio and so this is one that I just think would just be you know, an easy wear, something that uh, smells different from what, what everyone else is wearing, but not so different that you're in the 80s if you're not a fan of vintage fragrances, but you want to wear something discontinued and harder to find, Stash by Sarah Jessica Parker. I think that would make a, a really interesting Christmas scent because there's also something about that smokiness, that frankincense smoke, you know, it just gives off days of huddled around the fireplace, um, cracking walnuts, telling jokes, being with family. There is a little bit of that. This is not going to win any awards for most original fragrance or anything like that. The pistachio note is interesting, although I bet you if you didn't tell me it was here, I probably wouldn't be able to pick it out. But, um, but well done for what it is. Well done. And if you can find bottles for cheap, do it. Don't pay someone $200 because it's discontinued. That is not worth it to me. Um, but if you get a deal, like I did, if you can find it for 20 or 30 bucks, worth it. Um, okay. Three to come. So next on the list, we have another designer discontinued. And actually, all of these are designers here still that are coming. I tried to pick some easier fragrances to wear around family during the holidays. And this one is created by Shamala Mason Dew. And uh, this is called Avant Garde by Lanvin. And you can see this bottle leaks. This bottle has an issue. It constantly leaks, even though I haven't sprayed it in forever. It looks like there's fresh juice leaking around the outside. I have no idea how or why. So I need to review this before it gets any worse. The leak gets worse. But I will tell you that um, this fragrance is very reminiscent of... Um, avant-garde if you're a fan of um uh ysl's la nuit de l'homme or if you're a fan of terry mugler's pure havan there's a little bit of both i would say in avant-garde because there's this see it didn't want to spray there uh i need to i need to review this damn thing before the juice just all evaporates out so it opens up like Lana Wheat Delone. You definitely get that cardamom, juniper, black pepper, pink pepper designer like opening with some lavender. But um, very quickly, you get this beeswax, benzoin, tobacco thing. And um, so it's like spicy and sweet. Uh, ambery, cedar wood, vetiver, and there's a captive molecule in the base called Georgie wood which um, apparently is a Gibaudan molecule that's supposed to have a very clean, woody-like smell. But um, if you're a fan of designers, if you're a fan of discontinued designers particularly, Avant-Garde is um, an interesting one. I know Jeremy Fragrance recommended this long, long ago. Uh, this, and he also recommended a fragrance from the house of... Um, he recommended this little bad boy, which could also be on this list, actually, so you get a bonus. Jacques Fat Pour L'Homme. Definitely my two favorite Jeremy Fragrance recommendations. He hasn't had many hits for me, but those two, these two are, are good. They're both discontinued. Um, yes, Avant-Garde, I think, would be a good one to, um, to wear Christmas time because it has that... Um, you know, it has that masculine tobacco in the base, but it has that honey tilt to it. So there's a little bit of Amen Pure pure Havan in there, a little bit of the Lanoui de Lome from the cardamom, nutmeg, peppery, juniper, um, lavender, but it's well done. Shame that this one's discontinued. One of the better modern law bonds. Okay, two left. So... This one's an absolute legend. I don't have to spray it because I know it like the back of my hand. It is uh, a juice that my good friend Robes, Mark from the Robes 08 channel, called the Devil's Juice. And this is uh, Fahrenheit, if I could spell, 
Faren height. I want the note listing for you guys. Absolute from 2009. And so basically Fahrenheit Absolute is one of Francois Demachy's best, uh, I would say, flankers. This in Eau Sauvage Parfum from 2012. This uses that myrrh that he uses so well and I think goes perfect for Christmas. Uh, you think frankincense, you think myrrh. And um, it tones down that gasoline opening. So you can still definitely tell it's Fahrenheit. Uh, but the violet and the aromatic notes just seem to sort of um, make everything uh, float a little bit. And in, 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 it seems like all the notes are just sort of floating, right? Uh, and you don't get that big violet gasoline hit, that violet leaf gasoline hit like you do in the old school Fahrenheit. And it's more smoky. So it's smokier. There's more frankincense. Uh, and they've used what is on the bottle as what they say is oud wood, which is no doubt some sort of oud molecule, probably black oud or whatever they call it, nor limbanol mixed with black oud to create this oud accord. Um, but I really like this as a flanker. And I'll tell you what, when Francois Demachy uses myrrh, special things happen. This and Eau Sauvage Parfum are fantastic examples. Just a well done oriental spicy and no one's gonna be smelling like, like you if you wear something like this to Christmas. So the devil's juice, but I think it would actually be, um, I don't think you would be the devil walking in with this uh, on Christmas. I think it would work beautifully. So Fahrenheit, absolute. And finally, uh, maybe my Christmas day scent, I haven't decided, but I'm leaning towards this one because I think this would just be perfect. Uh, it's almost made for Christmas to me. This is called Lagerfeld Cologne. Well, it used to be called Lagerfeld Cologne. They then changed it to Lagerfeld Classic, and then they discontinued it after he died, which is an absolute shame. I don't know if you can see the difference in the juice color, but look at that. Uh, this is the newer one, and this is the older one. And the older Lagerfeld Cologne, uh, the new one is a, is a good rendition of it. I will tell you that. But um, really the biggest difference is the vintage version, the one that actually said cologne on the bottle, uh, it had more of a vintage masculine feel in the base. So they both open up with this orangey, sort of aldehydic, uh, very uh, powdery. This is the fragrance that sort of paved the way. And of course I ran out of blotters. So this is the fragrance to me that sort of um, paved the way for Obsession by Calvin Klein. Obsession by Calvin Klein. Yeah, it's like a huge aldehydic orange when it opens up. Um, and the, the new one, the one that says classic, is like if you're someone that doesn't want to offend, I would say I'd say go for the classic version because it removes more of the heavier oak moss and tobacco and the more manly notes from the past. This one includes them. And, and if you take a look at the brown juice, it almost is a good representation of that vintage woody, tobacco-y, oak mossy, musky, sort of man, more manly version of, of Lagerfeld. I actually like both. I like this version of classic that I have right here that I just sprayed. This is uh, Inter Parfums. Yeah, this is Inter Parfums. Um, they were the distributor for this one. It did a great job. Um, there's a little bit of orris root in here. It's powdery. Sometimes you get green touches. The sandalwood is beautiful. Um, I love the woody notes. I love the cedar. I love the touch of florals that you get. But really, you just get this big orange. It, it just feels like, see how orange this juice is? That's a good representation of sort of what you're smelling. It smells like a big, giant, powdery orange. Um, and this stays much more ambery. It's like a big, powdery orange amber is really what it is. Even though it says spicy oriental, it feels like you're wearing a big amber. Perfect for a day like Christmas. Perfect. It just has that. It just works with your body heat, as Chris from Scentland says. Like you're, you're, you, It just mixes with your body chemistry, chemistry to create something amazing. Beautiful. I, I am a huge fan of Lagerfeld Classic. There is also a women's version that you could find. Not a women's version, but they came out with a fragrance that is very similar. You could hunt for called KL. There's KL and there's KL Om. Um, they came out after the OG. Lagerfeld Classic kind of paved the way for things like Obsession and, and stuff like that. Um, 
But yes, deserves more love. And I can't believe they discontinued this. An absolute travesty. The good news is there were a lot of bottles floating around and the new stuff is still quite good. But if you can get your hands on the vintage, as always, I would recommend going for the one that says Cologne. It has more of the proper masculine notes in the base. Um, but this one's still quite good. So uh, I hope you guys have yourself the absolute best. Merry Christmas. Um, happy Holidays. Whatever you celebrate, hope your holiday season with your family is absolutely brilliant and the best. I thank everyone for joining me. Uh, let me know what your favorites are from the not discontinued and discontinued side of the aisles. Uh, I will try to do a live stream very soon because Sultan Pasha's decants arrived. The, I'm going to make Sultan Pasha's decants, so maybe I'll do them live on stream. But uh, I appreciate everyone watching, commenting, uh, you know, the uh, back and forth in the comments. I absolutely love, so thank you. Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks for joining me on the Christmas special. Cheers, guys. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.